Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Questions for Corbett. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. It is August of 2022, and let's get into today's question, which comes from Jackie, who wrote recently, To be brief, I was hoping you could point me to a reading list, please. If one is published on your website, I would label myself stupid and annoying since I searched there but could not find one. <laughs> Thank you for your work and your time, Jackie. Thank you for the question, Jackie. Uh, <laughs> I've said this before. I'll say it again. I get some version of this question every single week <laughs> without fail. <laughs> so <laughs> actually, yes, I do have some, in fact, more than one reading list for you to peruse. Uh, I don't think you're necessarily dumb. I guess my website is just poorly laid out, but <laughs> I assure you, I have some reading lists for you. So now, uh, let's go through some of them. For example, you could go to Interview 1429 on my website, where you can get James Corbett and Liberty Weekly recommend books, where there's a couple of dozen book suggestions for you there between myself, Patrick McFarlane, and Keith Knight. Uh, there's the tour of my bookshelf from Questions for Corbett number 35. There is the New World Order reading list that I did several years ago now. There's the World War I reading list that I did in Questions for Corbett number 42. There's the list of 25 books you should read, as well as another, another 25 books you should read. <laughs> There's the 2021 summer reading list. And oh yeah, by the way, if you use the tag, the books tag, as in corporatereport.com slash tag slash books, you will be able to scroll through and flip through the pages of every single book-related post, interview, article, whatever that I've ever done. So, <laughs> there's quite a few suggestions for you there. A good few hundred books, at any rate. But why not add some more? <laughs> there's a, you can never have too many reading lists, right? And in the spirit of the fact that I've just taught a course and done a documentary on mass media, today I present to you a mass media reading list. In fact, this reading list comes straight from the Mass Media A History online course itself. Yes, as I hope you know by now, I do have an online course about the history of mass media, six and a half hours of lectures on the topic, which references a couple dozen, couple of dozen books in and of itself. And if you have got the course, you will know that in the study guide that comes with each lesson, there is a recommended reading list, which is substantially similar to the re reading list you will find on the course notes on corbettreport.com slash mass media, which is the course notes for uh, the, at least the web version of those course notes. But actually, I added a few books in the meantime when I created the study guide. So there's a few more books in there for people who get the course outline. At any rate, why don't we just go through them? Now, here's another question, a related question from Jason, who did purchase the course and was thinking about starting the best way to start the course. And he wrote, I have just purchased your mass media course and I'm really looking forward to getting started with this. I appreciate your hyperlinks, references, and reading list, and just want to ask your advice on the latter. To get the most out of this, would, I be, would it be better to work through this reading list prior to or after each of the lessons before moving on to the next? If it were you taking this course, what would you do with it? What order would you do it in? All right, a couple of questions I think embedded there. One, um, Overall, I would say you do not need to read anything beforehand. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that any of the books are a prerequisite to the course. In fact, I would say take the course first and then decide what reading from or what books that I, I talk about in the course sound most interesting and dive into that because that will probably give you the greatest benefit. Um, having said that, you'd certainly, well, you might benefit from reading uh, Understanding Media or Amusing Ourselves to Death in order to better appreciate lesson two or something like that. But I would say you can go through the entire course and then go back to reading list. Or if you want to take it a, you know, a week at a time and read something in between, that might be up to you. But at any rate, as I say, there's no prerequisite to reading anything before you start taking the course. I would say just dive into the course and read what sounds interesting to you. On that note, let's clean out the media section of my bookshelf. which you will note is not a green screen, <laughs> as has been suggested by some in the past. <laughs> all right, so lots of books. And in fact, this isn't even all of the recommended reading because some of the recommended reading I only have in electronic form. So 
let's get into it. Um, we're going to start, actually, at the start. Why not? So we'll start with a book that you definitely saw me holding and brandishing at various times in the Media Matrix documentary. And in case you were wondering, this is Johann Gutenberg by Albert Kapper, that translated by Douglas Marden. And this is, I think, I, I don't know at this point, I, I don't really follow the Gutenberg scholarship that closely, but I believe this is the definitive one volume, if you need one volume on Gutenberg uh, in English, get Douglas Marden's translation of Albert Kapper's book, which uh, is now a few decades old, but uh, as far as I understand, the scholarship still holds up. In fact, a lot of the things that uh, uh, Kapper was hypothesizing about in this book turned out later uh, a lot of scholarship uh, around Gutenberg agreed with him. And that if that sounds like a confusing thing to say, it's because one thing that you will gain from reading this book is a better appreciation of just how little we know about certain aspects and details of Gutenberg's life. Um, for someone who had such an incredibly profoundly important influence on the development of the history of the world, uh, there are gaps in his biography where we really don't know. There's no... His, textual historical record of what he was doing in these years, and there's a lot of speculation to fill in the gaps. Um, it's it, That's an interesting aspect of this story that really jumped out at me, and just as a story, it is, it is interesting, at least to me, to read about Gutenberg and where he came from. I think it is important if you want to have a better appreciation of the printing press, where it came from, and, and also some of its ramifications, because one thing that I appreciate in here is that there's there's really an analysis of the kind of uh, the kinds of technical details that I think are important for a study of the printing press, like uh, what types of typescripts existed, or not typescripts, because of course type didn't exist before Gutenberg, but what types of scripts existed and how he developed and, and used them in developed them into typescripts and what kind of effect that had on scholarship and other things in the Middle Ages. Um, there's a lot of technical detail as well as biographical detail, as well as historical detail. And I think this is, I found it a very interesting and informative um, work. And I got mine secondhand, so I purchased it and it's still got the library <laughs> sticker from here in Japan on it. Um, but I, I think it's worth your time. Uh, by the way, I didn't say this before, but all of these books, of course, will be listed in the show notes for this edition of Questions for Corbett with links at, if at all possible, to the electronic version of it at archive.org or some other free place, so you don't have to, hopefully you won't have to spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars collecting these books, you can read the versions uh, available online for free. Uh, another book about the printing revolution in particular that I would highly recommend, although I don't have the physical copy because I have the electronic copy, is The Printing Revolution in Early Modern Europe by Elizabeth Eisenstein which is a very, it's a scholarly work, and she is clearly a very careful scholar that is very careful not to go beyond the bounds of speculation and, and keep things grounded in reality to say, to place the importance of the printing press in its historical development. And she does a very thorough, very good job of that. Um, she uh, makes it clear how important the printing press was, but doesn't say that everything that ever happened was a result of the printing press. She's very careful to delimit, to delimit the, the bounds of what she's claiming here. And I think, again, if you're interested in the subject, I think it's very interesting. It is a bit of a scholarly work, so maybe not for everyone. Um, another book that clearly I referenced in The Media Matrix and explained a little bit about its importance, Areopagitica by John Milton. This is a collection with Areopagitica and other writings, because the Areopagitica itself is actually not that long. Um, you could read it in one lengthy sitting if you wanted, or at least in a couple of uh, sittings. So uh, there's a lot of other writing Milton did, obviously. But as I said in The Media Matrix, as I explain in the course, the Areopagitica to this day is considered, at least in the English language, the the, the defense of free speech. Uh, it was in that context of the uh, the licensing act that Parliament was bringing in in England at that time. I lay out that historical context in detail in the course it, itself. So um, the, I uh, have a link for the text and for the audio version, the Gutenberg uh, audio, not the Gutenberg, the LibriVox audio. So you can just listen to it if you prefer that way. Um, 
Another book that I uh, talk about specifically in lesson one of the course is Public Opinion by Walter Lippmann. And if you're like me, you probably have heard of this book without having read it for many years. I remember from way back in the day, I remember hearing about Walter Lippmann and public opinion from people like Noam Chomsky or from um, uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, essentially manufacturing consent and things like that was embedded in in Lippmann. And so my received wisdom of what Lippmann was and what he was writing and the way he, he was just an elitist who just hated the public and wanted to control them, essentially. And that's what public opinion is about, right? And as I explained in the course, when I actually read this book, it was very, very different than what I had expected given everything I'd ever heard about Lippmann. Um, yeah, I'm sure he was an elitist in various ways, but this is actually a very interesting book um, in terms of almost a, a sort of pre-postmodern take on news itself and how it is read and understood and collected and what it means in its social context and other things that are surprisingly philosophical. It, it was actually quite interesting and I read various passages from it at the end of lesson one that I think are, I, I, I think it's worth your attention. Um, there's a lot in there to, to gain from it. Uh, another piece by uh, Lippmann that I think is important is Liberty in the News. This is a collection of a, a few different essays um, that he wrote on this, and it contains some, uh, some interesting insights into the concept of liberty and news and how those meld in, in the American Republic in the early 20th century, at the very least. Um, again, I think interesting. I think Lippmann is someone that you should probably read. Um, keep your ideological uh, defenses up against intrusion from elitist influences, as always, but keep the critical thinking switch on. But that goes for everything we ever read. Um, okay, next on the reading list, A Free and Responsible Press, which is the report, the final report of the Hutchins Commission. And uh, I, I'm assuming most people probably don't know about the Hutchins Commission at this point because it took place in the 1940s, and you know who would know about this? Um, but there was a uh, a commission that was commissioned by uh, essentially um, Henry Luce of Time and Life for fame, infamy, um, was the driving force behind putting this commission together. But then he kind of got sidelined in the whole process and he ended up almost disavowing this final report because they, they didn't want him at the meetings and other such things. Now, to put this in perspective, I'll recommend another book, <laughs> which will help you appreciate and understand this book a little bit. Uh, it's called An Aristocracy of Critics um, by Stephen Bates. And this is about the commission, how it came together, what it argued. But essentially what this is about, it was in the context of the idea, okay, we've, we're, we're, we've got the news press, the newspaper print press everywhere, and we've got radio and film and other sorts of mass media are arising. And that's sort of challenging certain ideas of what is the First Amendment and how does it apply and, and such things as, well, it, were the original founders of the United States, were they writing in the context of people who expected access to the press in the form of, say, the printing press, which most people had access to. But now we've got radio stations and things that most people do not have access to. Should they have access to? Should they be granted access? Does the First Amendment compel the government to give people access to the press? And all these sorts of things, um, these considerations that were going on around. And one thing that's interesting about this, this was the 1940s, but a lot of the things they were talking about, but what does free speech mean and how does it work and what is the government's role in regulating speech are the same questions that continue to be raised to this very day. So this was how they answered it back in the 1940s. And as I say, in order to, I think, appreciate this report, you would probably want to read An Aristocracy of Critics. So there's a, a couple of um, books that I will recommend. Uh, another book that I uh, I mentioned briefly in passing in um, in the course, uh, The Gray Lady Winked by Ashley Rinsberg. Um, it's it's all right. It wasn't exactly what I was expecting. I, I, I don't know exactly what I was expecting, but this is uh, a, a, more like a case study look at specific stories in the New York Times history and how the New York Times covered it. 
And there is definitely an ideological bent here by the author, which I do not necessarily share, you know, respect, and certain, certain of his choices are eyebrow-raising. But, at any rate, if you want some more fodder for uh, understanding why the New York Times is a propaganda rag, and has always been, there are certainly some good examples of that in here to be had. Uh, another book that I put in the reading recommended reading list, although I don't talk about it much in the course, is A Tyranny of Words by Stuart Chase, which you will remember um, from my episode, uh, I believe it is 350, I will have to double check that, but Brock will have it on screen, uh, on language as a weapon, uh, where I, I went into detail about Stuart Chase and his deconstruction, sorry, it was not 350. Anyway, I'll find the exact number. Um, uh, language as a weapon, which was talking about the weaponization of language for political purposes, and Stuart Chase breaks down how language itself has been weaponized and used by the press and others to direct people in various directions um, for political purposes, generally speaking. And I think it is an interesting and important way of sort of staying above the fray, as it were, and seeing this from the, the top, the topmost level, looking at the, the nature of language itself and how it can be used and wielded through whatever medium um, you wish in order to direct people in one direction or another. Uh, another book, which again, I don't have the physical copy of, but I, I'm loath to recommend, but I have to recommend it because it was genuinely helpful in various parts of constructing the mass media history story is From Gutenberg to Google by Tom Wheeler. <laughs> yes, that Tom Wheel Wheeler, um, former FCC chairman. So, uh, I again, I don't recommend putting money in Tom Wheeler's pockets, um, but this was a helpful and interesting book, um, including various things uh, about the, for example, the Gutenberg story and the Gutenberg conspiracy and how that came together and um, going on into the even the present age. So, of course, I do not agree with Tom Wheeler's general overall position and what have you, blah, blah, blah. But as history, there were some definitely some interesting things in there that I think are worth reading. Uh, uh, next book on the list is Understanding Media by Marshall McLuhan. I've talked about this in several interviews now, so I won't belabor the point. I think it is worth your time. Uh, McLuhan is a challenging and uh, uh, thought-provoking author on a lot of points. Again, this doesn't mean that he was some sort of crusading anti-globalist. <laughs> he was against the Illuminati or anything, or this is going to be... No, but this is a philosophical exploration of the nature of media itself and how that shapes our social and intellectual environment, how it shapes our psyche, how it shapes the course of history, what the electronic global consciousness means, and all of these really highfalutin ideas um, very much right up my alley. So take that for what it's worth. I think it's definitely worth your time, but it is very dense, not exactly reader friendly. If you're not into philosophy, then it would probably be a challenging read for you. Perhaps this one would be more up your alley, Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman, who openly admitted and quite often said, I am, I mean, if the charge is that I'm just McLuhan repeat, well then, okay. <laughs> I don't remember exact, <coughs> exactly how he phrased it, but something along those lines. He was essentially an acolyte of McLuhan, who um, popularized perhaps some of his thought, because Amusing Ourselves to Death, much more accessible as a book, <laughs> than understanding media. So, um, and although this was written in, I believe, the 1980s, and com clearly about essentially television as a medium, uh, it's still highly relevant to to today. And a lot of the insights in here, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a lot of the insights in here are absolutely as valid as the the day they were written. Um, I, again, I think I've probably talked about this at length before as well, so I won't belabor the point, but definitely worth your time. Very good read. Uh, in fact, almost anything by Postman is worth your time and attention. Okay, the next uh, book on the list is The Perfect Machine, Television and the Bomb by Joyce Nelson. Man, I'm glad I found this book, and at this point, I do not remember how on earth I found this book, because it's an obscure book. And I have no idea where I got the reference to it or 
why I got it. But at any rate, it's there on archive.org. I'm glad it is. It's, it's really an interesting book that ties together the history of the 20th century and the development of the atom bomb and television. And those stories are actually more literally related than you might think at first glance, but also metaphorically related. The explosion of the mind that took place in the 20th century. And that is, as I point out in the course, that is where I first saw the really hammered down version of that story about uh, the implanting of electrodes in people's heads to monitor their brainwave activity and all of that. I'd heard about that before, and yeah, television hypnotizes you. I'd heard that in general terms, but she has the specifics of the specific year in which that happened and the researcher who was behind it, and uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating book. There's a lot of very valuable information in there, so I hope people will check it out. Um, the next book on the list is this one. Uh, this one. Manufacturing Consent by Herman and Chomsky. And I believe, I can't remember at this point whether I put this in episode 420 where I previewed the course history. I did definitely mention, um, I, I quoted Manufacturing Consent in the clip that I played in 420. But after that, immediately after that, I talk about what, you're quoting Chomsky? And talked about oh, what that means and why and all of that. At any rate, I will just say, Manufacturing Consent is an important book. It is worth your time and attention. Caveat, uh, the specific examples in here are obviously quite, quite dated at this point. This, again, book from the 1980s. A lot of, a lot of the examples in here. Um, if you're interested in the various attempts at or at, at democracy or overthrow of democracy in Latin America in the 1980s, boy, <laughs> have I got a book for you. <laughs> but the, the thesis of this and the fleshing out of that thesis in at the very least in the introduction and conclusion is, I think, seminal important work. And the propaganda model itself is extremely important. And bonus point for people like myself who do not like Chomsky. Uh, it, as Chomsky himself admitted and said, th this is Herman and Chomsky and should be credited that way because the propaganda model was Edward S. Herman's baby. That was his baby. Chomsky just threw in all the Latin American democracy, you know, this is how the news covered that kind of stuff, those specific examples. Herman had the propaganda model, he developed it, and it's an incredibly important model for understanding how media censorship really works, really functions, where you do not need every single person in a media outlet to be, to be even to be told what the official line is or how to keep to it. They will know simply by the bounds of the, the propaganda model itself. Incredibly important stuff, um, as I say, at the very least in the the sort of the overall fleshing out of that idea. Um, the next book on the list, another book that I'm glad I found. I, I'm sure I would never have found it unless I was specifically researching this topic and trying to find various books on this, but I'm glad I found it because it's an interesting story and it covers some interesting history. It's called The Network, The Battle for the Airwaves and the Birth of the Communications Age. It's by Scott Woolley, and it is ostensibly about the relationship between David Sarnoff and Edwin Armstrong and their collaboration, which resulted in AM, which eventually became the sort of the radio industry as we knew it. Uh, at that time, it was uh, the big development that allowed the radio industry to develop. Um, but it's actually a much bigger story about the development of radio and even into the satellite age. It <laughs> Again, this is supposedly about Sarnoff and Armstrong, but even after both characters are dead, the story continues on. So, <laughs> I don't know. I guess that's just a framing device. But it's uh, a lot of interesting history in there. Um, so, And I do talk about it in the course. Would definitely recommend, if you're interested in this material, you'd be interested in that book. Um, next book on the list is Hadley Cantrell's The Invasion from Mars. And uh, this... I did reference it. Yes, I did specifically reference this in the Media Matrix, so you should know at least something about this. This was the report that was produced by by the Princeton Radio Project, but this is really Hadley Cantrell's baby, um, about the War of the Worlds broadcast. And this was the actual research that was done 
um, in the immediate aftermath of that. Literally, I think the next day they started sending out teams of researchers to interview people and what have you, almost as if they were all ready for it. I don't know. But at any rate, um, Rockefeller-funded Princeton Radio Project, they're on the scene to find out as much as they could about this completely fake news event that some people some people took for real and yes as i say in the media matrix as i say in the course it's become fashionable to say ah it was all just a ah, it was all overblown it was there was no one really believed it some people really did and there, this book uh, this book not only provides the actual sociological research with the numbers and the figures and here's the questionnaire and here's how it was delivered and to whom and that kind of technical detail but also has some interesting conclusions about this including um, as I believe I stressed, I did talk about this book way back in the day, um, talking about how to free the, your tax cattle, whatever that episode of the podcast was called. I don't remember off the top of my head. Again, it'll be on screen. I, I would really suggest you check that out or re-watch that if you haven't yet. Um, because one of the conclusions in here is that people who took even the slightest bit of uh, effort to try to triangulate this information they were hearing on this one radio station. Oh my god, we're being invaded by Martians. People who did so much as turn the dial to see if, maybe, you know, is, is it any other station reporting that we are being invaded by Martians? <laughs> People who did even that much immediately discovered, oh, this isn't real, right? But, um, and they're part of their conclusion is, you know, people who take even the slightest effort to try to triangulate or, or hammer down information will be immune from the effects of the mind control effects of this social control box essentially which is valuable to think about even in our own day and age isn't it um the next book on the list is called the tv delusion a psychology of belief it's by uh simon day and joanna vanderleer and this is another book that i probably never would have probably would not have crossed my radar except for the fact that i met Simon and Joanna in Copenhagen when I was giving my lecture there on Echoes of World War One, and um, I met them there and they they had this book. Uh, I believe they they gave me this copy of their book. Um, and again, it does have some important information about um, those TV experiments, uh, the hypnosis idea, as well as just sort of broadly um, talking about uh, the TV and its effects on people. Um, as well as how propaganda works and things like that. It's uh, very much, I, I would say, up the alley of Corporate Report listeners. So thank you to Simon and Joanna for that book. Um, the next book on the list is Surveillance Valley, The Secret Military History of the Internet by Yasha Levine, which hopefully will be familiar to you if you remember my work on um, the Silicon Valley, uh, the, what, uh, the secrets of Silicon Valley, what big tech doesn't want you to know. Um, swirling around those ideas and the development, the early development of what became the internet and the entire idea of databasing dissidents and tracking them electronically and all of that, very much not just not just sort of broadly, yeah, the military created the internet, but looking at the specifics of that, what that means, um, very important bit of history for people who want to know about that. Uh, the next book on the list is 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now by Jaron Lanier. Um, I certainly don't recommend Jaron Lanier as some sort of I, political commentator, certainly. Um, no. Uh, he, uh, I, for example, in 10 Arguments, one of the arguments is, is essentially like, well, social media is spreading all this horrible, dastardly fake news. Like, the fake news that Hillary Clinton lost the 2016 selection. <laughs> it was those damn Russians and their their social media manipulations that did it. So, whatever. Linear is clearly not um, someone to be taken seriously on the political front. But, um, as a techie, um, his insights into social media, how it functions, how it does such things as make you into an asshole, that it brings out the inner asshole in people and things like that. And I... I ultimately, I think he is right. I think you should delete your social media accounts right now. <laughs> I agree. Um, anyway, any wait, uh, at any rate, um, that book is out there um, and probably worth your attention. Uh, Hate Inc. by Matt Tybee, uh, which I talked about in Precedent Trump, so you already know a little bit about it. Um, but I will just reiterate here that I certainly have my differences with Tybee on such things as 9-11 Truth, so I certainly do not think that he is... Uh, 
someone I would hold up as a font of truth. But um, given his family history, his father was a, a mainstream reporter and he grew up in that environment. So he has that sort of perspective on the media. He's obviously been involved in the media, writing for Rolling Stone and others for many years now. And Hate Inc. is an interesting exploration of the news media in the 21st century and how it functions, sort of an update to manufacturing consent, but looking at the modern era uh, of, of news media and, and the business of news media and how it functions in the current environment. Again, I think interesting to people who, uh, who are interested in the subject generally. The next book is Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. Uh, this one came up uh, in from one of the people who were taking the course who suggested that I look into this, and I did. And I'm glad I did, uh, because I'd heard of Bowling Alone and sort of the broad thesis, but I'd never actually read it. So after reading it, um, it's, it's amazing to me this became a bestseller, <laughs> because it is very much a sociological work with a lot of detail about percentages and surveys and what have you. But... Anyway, uh, it makes a very important point, which is the, the there absolutely, in any metric, by any way you measure it, there was a uh, marked decline in social capital in the United States in the latter half of the 20th century. And he goes through the early half of the 20th century and the various groups and social, social groups and, and participation in organizations and the various bowling leagues and other things that existed, religious organizations, community organizations, various ways that people could be involved in their communities. And no matter what you're measuring, they all started to fall off a cliff in the latter half of the 20th century. And Putnam goes through various possible explanations for this, and I think he's right in saying there is no one single smoking gun and everything can be explained by it. But one thing that he does bring up and does go through, but I think doesn't give enough e emphasis, is... TV. You know, what could possibly be causing people to more and more, and at an increasing rate as time goes by, detach from their civic life and things that are going on around them. Suddenly people are spending all of that time that they would be outside and meeting people and talking to people and in organizations, they're spending it in front of the TV at home. Um, there is absolutely, undeniably, a correlation going on there, and I would argue a strong causation. Again, it's not 100%, but I think the, the advent of TV was a huge contributory factor to the decline of that social capital. Um, and how much worse is it today now that the TV that we all have at home and sitting in front of us, now we're just carrying it around in our pocket in the form, form of the smartphone so that we can literally detach from people even when we are out in the real world. A lot to think about. Anyway, Bowling Alone might be one source for that, although, as I say, it's a, a deep dive book. Um, the next book on the list is, is on the recommended reading list in the course. I don't actually talk about it in the course, but I think it is relevant to the course and what it's talking about. A State of Fear, How the UK Weaponized Fear by Laura Dodsworth, um, which I've mentioned a few times in the past, um, but essentially this is Laura Dodsworth's exploration of uh, how the UK government manipulated and ginned up the fear of the scamdemic in order to pass emergency laws and restrictions and other things to, to shape people's behavior. And that, as she points out, and details, exhaustive detail, this isn't just something that kind of happened, oh, I don't, we don't know what we're doing. No, this was a specific, deliberate agenda that was laid out by specific groups and bodies and panels and other such things. And she goes through that. And I think it's highly relevant because... If you want a case study of how media can prescribe people's behavior and actually shape their the way that they act and interact in the world, just look at what's happened over the past couple of years and think to yourself, would that would what we've seen over the past couple of years, would that have been possible in that way in a pre-mass media age? I suppose. I mean certainly there were there were plagues and other, you know, mass panics in the past, pre pre pre-printing press. But I, the way that this functioned, the, sp the rapidity with which this all spread, the uniformity of um, expression in terms of what people are allowed to say about these things, I think uniquely media-related phenomena that are worth uh, examining in that context. Uh, I 
on the recommended reading list. I put in another Neil Postman book. As I said before, probably anything by Postman is relevant. Um, this one also, Technopoly, The Surrender of Culture to Technology, um, which was written, I believe, in the 1990s, so slightly newer than the Amusing Ourselves to Death. And he starts to touch on computers and internet and things like that in its very nascent stage there in the 1990s, but I think situates the, the electronic media in a more of a 21st century context, or at least closer to the 21st century. And then the last book on the reading list, the recommended reading list, uh, is Simulacra and Simulation by Jean Baudrillard. And <laughs> as I say in the course, I quote a bit of it in the course, and <laughs> if philosophy is not your thing, <laughs> yeah, I would probably not recommend this book, but it's very much my thing. So I I think it's fascinating. I think there's some incredibly important insights in here and some mind-bending things to think about. Um, at the very least, uh, there's some, in the transcript, in the hyperlinked transcript for the course, when I'm talking about the uh, various things about Baudrillard and what's been said about him, and I mention, for example, of course, he was, uh, Simulacra and Simulation was one of the things cited by the uh, Wachowskis as one of their inspirations for the Matrix. And, but Baudrillard famously said that the Matrix is the type of movie that the Matrix would make about the Matrix. <laughs> so <laughs> Baudrillard was a fascinating thinker, uh, I think. And uh, anyway, if philosophy is your thing, worth your time, I think highly relevant to what we're stepping into with regards to the metaverse. And this idea now that everything is a simulation and people will increasingly be growing up their entire lives embedded in the simulated reality of the screen. And there's no way to understand that that isn't a fundamentally different reading of what it means to be human. Again, this is why, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, this is why the study of mass media and its development is so incredibly important. I think it's important in and of itself and for understanding where we are right now and how we got here and all of that. I think it's fascinating. I, I, uh, your schools lie to you. History is not boring. It is not dusty. It isn't, oh, do I have to? Oh, do I have? What, are, what names and dates am I going to have to memorize for the test? No, it is incredibly important to understand who, who we are as humanity and how we got here in this situation. Anyway. As I say, if you've even just watched the Media Matrix documentary series, I think you, I trust that you'll understand that this is actually very interesting, very thought-provoking, and very relevant uh, information. But why is it so vitally important? I think one of the most important issues that we are facing is because where we are going with this. And now that uh, latest surveys showing that uh, American adults are spending as much as 11 hours a day in media, 11 hours a day in various forms of media, mostly embedded in their smart, with their nose in their smartphone, but still, and we're, it's only going up from here. And pretty soon we will literally be strapping on the goggles and going into the, I mean, it, it, this is the game for all the marbles. And I think it's incredibly important that we start confronting these issues about media and how it functions on us and whether we can put the brakes on it, which is something that Postman addresses quite specifically in Amusing Ourselves to Death. And he was not optimistic about that. And he certainly said Luditism, Luditism doesn't work. And he cites historical examples of that and etc. cetera. Um, but it's something that we need to start thinking about. And I do, of course, raise those questions quite a bit in the online course. So that's the reading list for the online course. Um, I have some other books here, but they're, they didn't make it on the reading list. But anyway, again, there's so much material to go through here. And as I hope you can appreciate just from watching the Media Matrix series, there's uh, that just skims the surface of the story. If you want to start diving into that story in greater detail, get the online course. If you are interested in the subject, I'm saying it will be worth your time. There is an incredible amount of information embedded in here. And um, I think, as I say, highly, highly relevant to where we are today and extremely important for where we're going tomorrow. So anyway, uh, that's, well, that's another couple dozen books at least uh, to add to the few hundred that I've already recommended in the past. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure you'll get through this in a week. So I'll have to 
<laughs> recommend some more next week, right? But at any rate, um, that's the reading list that I recommend. And as I say, uh, if you haven't watched the Media Matrix series yet, what are you doing? You should watch that first. And then I, I highly recommend uh, getting the course. I really do think it will be worth your time. And uh, I should say, I am. I, I think I will do a Q&A on mass media history, specifically for students of the online uh, mass media course. If you have purchased the course, if you're taking the course, if you have questions that arise from that course, I'll do a Q&A on that if there are enough questions um, uh, to answer. So in the next couple of weeks, if you, have, if you are a student of the course, if you have purchased the course, send in your questions. I'll, I'll collect them up and answer them in a Q&A. Um, but I think that's going to do it for today. Uh, a lot of reading. And as I say, all of the links to all of the, as in every case possible, to archive.org version or gutenberg.org version or the LibriVox version of these texts so you don't have to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars co uh, collecting all of the th these books, um, will be available in the show notes for this edition of Questions for Corbett. But that's going to do it for today. I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Thank you for joining me here, and I'm looking forward to talking to you again in the near future.